of a number of our um, advisors and uh, each with different specializations to give kind of a brief overview of what we're seeing and working on in our respective markets. Um, now, as usual, I just want to remind everyone that we are open for questions. This is a Q&A, so I urge you to participate over on the right-hand side in the chat. Um, use it for any questions you have. Feel free to ask them, even while each of the presenters is uh, uh, engaged in teaching or whatever, talking about their subject. So feel free to ask questions at any time. We're going to do our best to answer them all. Um, and we're going to be covering a lot of different asset types, locations, all the way from apartments and different commercial deals. Uh, or commercial um, assets all the way from Orange County and into Los Angeles counties. Um, so without further ado, we might as well just get started here. Uh, first on our lineup, we've got, uh, it's our pleasure to introduce Ryan Rayburn, um, Executive VP of Investments here. He's got over 17 years in the industry with experience and uh, in 2019 was our number one agent. Um, also a Long Beach native. So welcome, Ryan. He's going to be discussing South Bay. Uh, our multifamily specialist there. Yes, Don. Thank you so much, and you know, thank you for everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Ryan Rayburn. I've been in commercial real estate for over 17 years. Um, and when I was asked to give a market update, especially in the South Bay and the South LA area, um, I started to realize, you know, the diversity of these different markets. Uh, really came into play, and, and rather than boring you with each submarket and a bunch of slides, um, I thought it might be more value to everyone in attendance uh, to maybe do a little bit more of a, a, a broad stroke um, and discuss some of the you know the current trends that we're hearing investors discuss um, out there in the marketplace, and to share some different strategies strategies that they are using uh, to maybe just create a little bit more thought provoking ideas. Um, to maybe want to reevaluate your situation. Um, if you would like to do a deep dive and you are interested in uh, really getting a better idea of what exactly is happening in your submarkets, please, by all means, reach out to someone here at Centennial Advisors. We're absolutely happy to dive into the numbers with you and discuss the current trends specific to your marketplace, your product type, and such. Um, but before you jumping into the stock and velocity of the marketplace, um, I thought it might be really important to discuss one of the biggest aspects of investment real estate, um, and that being the rental market. Um, hopefully, over the last few months, um, you've been reached out by one of my colleagues um, and were asked to kind of discuss how your rent collections have been. Um, and I think something that we've all seen and it's been really exciting and somewhat of a highlight is the fact that uh, rental collections have really exceeded expectations um, and it's definitely a highlight of the marketplace as of today uh, i think collections have been better than most people anticipated in fact um, i think if you're looking at buyers and you're talking to banks and what we saw with our escrows uh, pre-covid um, is that banks were very aggressive interest rates were phenomenal uh, but as soon as covid started to hit uh, we started to see a, a big pullback on um, you know, banks willing to lend dollars and it had a lot to do with really trying to gauge the risk that was out there. Um, I think most people that um, are owners and operators in today's market, when they heard about, you know, the stay at home ordinance, uh, we really thought or really believed um, that, you know, no one was going to pay rent um, and why should they, right? Uh, but I think what really kind of happened, I think tenants started to educate themselves and they still they started to realize that, you know, the cancel rent option just really wasn't ever going to be um, a reality. And the fact that they, if they truly liked where they live, um, it would probably in their best interest to start to uh, pay the rents and try to stay up to date with their payments as much as possible. Um, I think one thing we also saw, and for those who have been in the business for a very long time, is the fact that the government really stepped in in a, a much rap more rapid pace than previous downturns. Um, and I really think some of that PPE money, that $600 a month, uh, really aided in the people's ability to um, help with the lack of rent collections. Um, you know, that $600 a week absolutely helped. Um, I think it helped keep a lot of people in place and as current as it possibly could. Um, one thing that we definitely did see, though, was a, a shift 
um, in the renter pool and what they desired as renters. Um, you know, I think the, the, the product type or the asset class that really took the biggest hit um, from what we're starting to see up from a rent collection standpoint is the, the class A product. Um, I think people or renters specifically really started to take a look at, um, you know, what is my disposable income and what percentage of that disposable income um, was my rent taking part of? Um, I think with COVID also um, taking it up and making a stamp on, on the market, uh, we also saw the fact that, you know, high density probably wasn't the best place where people wanted to be. Um, I think people, the current trend was really to start to look at um, bigger spaces and, and where people could actually um, go and do the live and work um, and feel like they had enough space to be effective in, in that. Um, something so larger floor plans definitely became in favor um, over high density. Um, and I think what that also did was as we started to see that class A product um, have to see the upward take in, in vacancy, uh, it was a big benefit for uh, the B and C class uh, product types where um, you know, more and more renters were having to go to because A, we saw a lot of the development projects starting to get scrapped. Um, so those units aren't gonna be coming to market in the form of a shadow market. Um, we also saw the class A's obviously take on some more vacancies. Um, and if, you know, at that point, you know, really tenants only had a couple of options, move back home or start to double up or start to look at more affordable you know, apartment units. Um, and so again, we already had pent up demand prior to COVID. Uh, we saw this, um, you know, the stay at home ordinance, we had an absolute effect on, on the job markets and ability of people's of income. Um, and then we saw people start to reassess, you know, am I, do I really want to be paying that much um, in rent um, versus having a little bit more, you know, liquidity in, in their day-to-day -day monthly um, expenses. Um, something we also saw was a, a strong, or not necessarily strong, but definitely a demographic um, starting to become more, more interested in becoming home buyers. Uh, I think the aging millennials um, we're starting to get into a number where it's like, okay, rents are super expensive. Maybe it's time for us to, you know, look into home ownership. And I think that was a great thing for, um, you know, California. Uh, but I think we realized and for all those who have friends that are in the residential uh, real estate game, um, there's just really a lack of inventory in housing uh, and the price points have continued to go up. Um, and so therefore, even the aging millennials, even with the good jobs during COVID, um, don't really want to be in that class A product, uh, but they've also become forced renters. Um, and so I think that's another good thing and a positive thing for your, you know, B and C class ownership. Um, so again, I think the, the reassessment of, you know, what in, amenities are important, uh, the value on square footage, the not wanting to be into the high density area um, is somewhat been a highlight for us, you know, B and C class owners, because we saw that pent up demand roll into more demand um, into the COVID market. Um, but there are concerns, right? Um, obviously the PPE, the $600 a, a week is starting to has burned off, um, you know, the, the back and forth in the political in the political arena, uh, what's gonna happen from there is still a big concern. Um, you know, what is that $600 gonna look like? Is it gonna be $200? Is it gonna be $400? Um, and is $200 in a, in a high, uh, rental market going to be even enough to help, you know, supplement that loss of rental income. And so those are some of the questions I think we all have uh, moving forward. Um, I think the other big question is, um, especially, we're obviously in an eviction moratorium. Um, and I think the big question at hand is, is Gavin Newsom and, and the government going to be expanding that? Um, or is September 30th actually going to be a date um, when we can actually um, start to implement some of the eviction notices. Um, so I think the rental market has been a big driver of the market. I think obviously when you're looking at invest investments, you want to make sure that income is there. Um, and so I think the rental market has definitely been a highlight. Um, in regards to the sale transaction, we've absolutely seen a huge decrease in the number of transactions that have occurred. Uh, we're seeing upwards of 50% decrease in velocity. Uh, but the one thing I think the shiny moment is that cap rates and price points really haven't moved. Um, from the centennial perspective, we've had you know three, 
In the last two weeks, we put three deals under contract here in Long Beach. Uh, multiple of those properties have gone under contract at full price. Uh, so there are absolutely buyers in the marketplace. And I think some of the bigger drivers um, out there have been uh, the fact that the rental market has been a little bit better than we anticipated. Uh, but really, there's just opportunity out there. And I think COVID is going to create some of the biggest buying opportunities that we've ever seen in any given marketplace. Um, I think from an investor standpoint, um, although a lot of people want to start want to lean back and hope for an REO market, I don't think we're going to see that, um, especially from the quickness in the government response. But I think the opportunity really lies in the fact that we might start to see um, more generational type assets come to the marketplace. And so rather than waiting for these extreme cap rates, um, I think investors are going to start to look at, hey, where exactly, you know, what does my portfolio look like today? Um, you know, where is my cash flow compared to market? And can I be doing something better with my equity? Um, so again, I'm getting a little long winded and I know I'm a little short on time and I know we have other speakers that we want to um, speak with you. Uh, but what I would suggest is now more than ever, it's a great time to look at your equity position. Is your equity working for as hard as it can for you? If not, give Centennial a call. Let's take a look at that. Um, again, I think interest rates are another huge driver in the marketplace um, where you're able to, to leverage up, pick up more units, pick up more square footage. But at the end of the day, it helps you with principal pay down. You get the appreciation. You can pick up more depreciation, show them more of that income. Um, and at the end of the day, we're seeing a, a huge flight to quality, uh, whether that's less management intense properties um, or just really parking your money in a, in a demographic that has um, better jobs and in better areas. Uh, and still maintain your cash flow, quite honestly, improving it. Um, so that's something we absolutely see. I know we're running short on time. And I, again, I just want to thank Don for hosting us today. Um, I, again, we have a lot more information to share with you. And if you have any questions in regard to sale velocity, transaction, rentals, or just opportunities because you're looking to add to the portfolio, uh, please reach out to Centennial Advisors. We're here to help. We want to create a relationship with you. Uh, we want to be a resource for you. Um, and quite honestly, you know, we, we really try to put the, the clients first um, and, and give you that Nordstrom's um, experience of brokerage. Um, and hopefully through these webinars, you're starting to um, feel that. So, um, Don, I'm going to throw it back to you. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, sorry if I ran a little long, but obviously there's a lot going on right now. And so I you know, thank you for hosting this. Thank you, Ryan. Um, we'll just jump right on to uh, introduce our next speaker here since Ryan took up all my filler time. <laughs> um, and I could address the elephant in the room, but I'll leave you all hanging to wonder what's going on and we'll introduce him later. But um, Doug Shea is going to join us here. Doug, if you're there, Doug comes to us with obviously a lot more uh, experience than most, Thirty over 30 years as a veteran of commercial brokerage. Um, and a South, uh, or sorry, a, a Long Beach native. Um, he's going to be talking to us a little bit about uh, self-storage, retail, triple net lease deals. There he is. Hey, Doug, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Don. Thanks for introducing us and introducing me anyway. And glad Brian finally got off of there. That took a little while, didn't it? Anyway, um, I'm going to speak today on self-storage and triple net simultaneously. And as Ryan said, our time is short, a little bit shorter all of a sudden, because uh, there is so much information, we'll probably have to come back next week and give a little bit more. So self-storage right now is selling like hotcakes in California. We can't, we can't get enough listings, people are buying them, it's because of the interest rates, it's because of the ease of the management of self-storage. A lot of multifamily people are getting into self-storage because how many people in the self-storage realm have actually got a phone call from their tenant and said that their toilet has stopped up. Not one. That's great for the multifamily people. They don't like those calls at all. No, nobody else does. So we're talking self-storage and the cap rates have been moving a little bit. Even with COVID, it does not seem to have been affected with the COVID right now as far as sales. So people are still buying. People are still refinancing. People are still looking to buy more. And we are Centennial Advisors Argus. Argus is our national affiliate. So as you can see, we have national touch all the way from New York to Florida, 
to Oregon, to Washington, to California, the whole entire United States. So if you're looking for an investment, we're not just in California, we can find your locations anywhere in the country. And as Justin has said in the past, you can see which states are the most friendly as far as real estate and regulations. So as of right now, I'm extremely bullish on Idaho, Utah, Arizona, Nevada, um, Colorado. That's about as bullish as I get right now. Oh, in Texas, Austin, Texas seems to be also one of the number ones. Now we're also talking triple nets, triple net investments. Now, why are we talking about that as the same time as we're talking about self storage? Well, people in self storage are also selling and needing wanting less management. Well, what's the least amount of management that there is, is a triple net investment. Now, a triple net investment, for example, and I'll give you one that I just sold not too long ago, is a DeVita Dialysis Center. So what that is, it's a medical dialysis center where they have it anywhere from a 10 to 15 to a 25-year lease. You're buying the asset. It's called triple net because the nets are the roof, the taxes, the insurance, the maintenance. None of that goes to the landlord. That all goes to the tenant. So as they call them in the industry, coupon clippers, all you do is receive a check. So you just sold your self storage facility for say $4 million. And now you're looking at a triple net because you don't want to do any management at all. You do have to realize with self storage, you are kind of buying a job. You still have, you have to be there. you you have to hire employees, things like that with a triple net investment. All it is, is a coupon clipper. You're just getting that check every single month. Now, why are you moving your money right now? Well, interest rates are such devastatingly low number. I've never seen it like this. I don't think we'll ever see it again. So people can now buy more building. They can buy at, you know, a $4 million. What would we have the other day? A Neater's Bakery in Utah for 4 million. Well, your interest rate I closed one deal where the interest rate was 3.74% over 25 year amortization. I mean, that's amazing. If you're, if you're able to bring that money over to any of these different investments and you only have a 3.4 interest rate, some are even sub sub threes into the twos. So there is still a tremendous amount of activity in both the triple nets and also the self storage. It appears today. I also just received, two DeVitas that are going to go on the market for sale, um, both in the Michigan area, both in the cap rates around six, we're going to comp them out a little bit more to make sure we're doing the right cap. And that's what we do is we analyze every single property of uh, our listings, or if you're looking at buying a self storage, or if you're looking at buying a triple net, we analyze it extremely well. So we, we wouldn't let you buy something that we ourselves wouldn't buy. So for example, the DeVita in um, Dearborn, Michigan, what, what is that like? Well, we know DeVitas are never going to go away. They are not going to cure kidney disease. You know, you have to go there. If you have kidney disease, you have to have dialysis. You know, that's COVID resistant. It's recession resistant. It's everything resistant. You know, they, they are not going to go away. But you also have to ask yourself too, what is going to go away? If you all of a sudden come to my market and say, gosh, I really like that auto zone. Well, are auto zones going to stick around? It's kind of a question we ask ourselves in the offices as to which investments are best due to that fact. Now, can you go and work on your car right now? Like your dad did? No. So what are you buying at auto zone batteries and oil? And that's it. What's going to happen when it's all electric and there's no oil any longer? You know, those are just some questions that we ask ourselves um, when we're looking for investments. Another investment is not just six months ago, maybe even nine months ago, you say an Applebee's. Well, with Applebee's, they don't have a lot of outside dining. What's going to happen to them? They were already hurting a little bit, but now they're, they may just end up going away. They're even talking about Denny's and IHOP going away. So I loved IHOP as an investment. I thought they'd never go away. Everybody wants pancakes. So anyway, you, you have to ask yourself, are these 
institution is going to stick around. You have to look really closely on these triple nets. You can't just go out and grab one because you like the looks of it and it's pretty. You have to research the future. So we do that for you also. We also research the location, the, um, you know, the tenant. One of the other aspects of a triple net that I like to look at is Okay, why is this a five cap or a four cap? Well, the person that owns the IHOP may own 60 IHOPs or it may be corporately backed. So if you're looking at a corporately backed IHOP or someone that just is a one-off, your cap rate is gonna vary by probably a point to a point and a half. And that's what you have to look at. That's what you have to research. But that's for um, another day for us to really get into triple nets and to really get into self storage. So for right now, as we end it for my section, I will turn it back to Idan. Information. Um, next up on our lineup here, we've got uh, someone who I've had the pleasure of touring an amazing off-market deal yesterday, as a matter of fact. The most sweeping views I've ever seen of Los Angeles. Uh, but this guy, Tom Watkins, comes with uh, a lot of experience. Great guy to be around. He's going to talk about... Uh, uh, Los Angeles apartment as he specialized in and done over a hundred million dollars in transactions. So welcome, Tom. Awesome. Thank you, Don. And uh, thank you, Doug and Ryan. Good insight on the market. Um, luckily, earlier this week, CoStar put out a pretty good update on the LA apartment market. So I thought I'd share some of those slides with you today. Um, the first slide that we have here takes a look at the daily asking rent per square foot. Uh, you can see there it drops significantly and with no, no surprise, um, it started when the pandemic started. Um, please keep in mind, this does only include properties with 50 plus units, uh, which many agree are seeing the biggest correction throughout the virus so far. Um, the good news, I guess, is after seeing the largest drop in the early months of COVID, Rents have shown some signs of stabilizing and they expect to kind of stabilize through the second part of the year. Uh, we can move to the next slide, please. Okay, so this one is the change in rent uh, beginning in March. And obviously LA is not a one size fits all city when it comes to rent loss. Uh, the change in rents really is dependent on the neighborhood within the city. It seems from this chart, uh, we definitely see that rent losses have been greatest in the class A apartments. Class A apartments tend to be near job hubs um, on the west side, but overall it seems that the LA's priciest neighborhoods are seeing the steepest decline in rents. So that's what we can get from, from that slide there. Next slide, please. This one's probably on everyone's mind. Um, it's really saying, are tenants paying rent? Um, and according to the National Multi-Housing Council, the answer is yes. Um, it kind of compares households that have paid some portion of their rent to the same period last year. And 95% of renters have made some form of payment in July. So that's good news. The caveat to this, of course, is we all know that this was supported by the CARES Act, and that's been kind of ballooning all these numbers up. So I think everybody's really interested to see uh, how the August collection works out. But so far, so good. It seems 95% of renters have been paying. Uh, we can go to the next one. This one's a big one. Um, you can see the dip earlier from the recession of 2008 and 2009. Then it was a big party for a while. Um, and actually $11 billion in apartment sales took place in LA in 2018 and 2019. So that, that led the entire nation in transaction volume. Um, the second quarter of 2020, definitely was the most lighted, lightly traded since 2011. Um, I know internally at Centennial, we see momentum picking up each and every week. 
just in the deals that we're doing, the people that we're talking to. Um, so we're hoping for a quicker recovery than, than some people are predicting. And then the last slide, um, this just shows that deals are still getting done. Um, you can see this property. It was actually built by Jamison Services, who's one of the most active developers in Koreatown. They sold a 72 unit building in 2018 for 32 million. So this is new construction, but when you look at the price per unit, you look at the cap rate, things haven't changed too much um, from, from where they were trading before. Um, so another thing to look at with this is Jamison sold this property. They never sell properties. So it really kind of makes you wonder, are investors kind of changing their strategy moving forward? Uh, Jamison's been known to be buy and hold type owners. So that'll be interesting to see what shakes out with uh, that kind of ownership. Um, those were kind of the, let's see. I think those were the most important slides that I took from what CoStar put out this week. Um, I want to leave you with this. I think every property is truly case by case. It's based on location. It's based on operations and rent collections. So if you're looking to sell a property, properties with weak operations are not going to yield a top dollar right now. But on the other hand, if you have a well-managed property, good collections, good management, you're still gonna get a really good price for your property. So keep that in mind. Um, any questions, feel free to reach out and appreciate it. Great job, Tom, great info. Thank you very much for all of that. Um, I just wanna remind everybody that this uh, uh, is open to questions. So if anybody listening or watching out there um, has any questions, feel free to type them on the right hand side in the chat bar and we'll be sure to answer them. Uh, next, we're going to move on here to our Orange County Industrial Specialist. Welcome, Sean. Take Thank you away. very much, Adon. Hi, my name is Sean Bainey. I'm an advisor with Centennial, specializing in the Orange County industrial sector. I'm going to try and cover a bunch of stuff, um, pack a lot of information in, but mainly I want to focus on where the market is today, some opportunities and challenges moving forward. And finally, some recommendations if you are one of our industrial owners. So first of all, the industrial market was and continues to be strong pre and post COVID or in the middle of COVID. All the product types um, that were impacted, I think industrial by far was the least severe. We've seen the lowest price adjustment of any product type and really the lowest lease rate adjustment too. Um, currently, industrial has the highest amount of tenants paying rents across all commercial property types. And this is really due to the essential tenants and businesses, uh, manufacturing, warehouse, distribution, cold storage, telecom, data centers, flex spaces, they've all experienced pandemic resistance and in many cases have exceeded expectations. Uh, properties that we really see moving quickly from an investment perspective, freestanding buildings, 50-50 FAR better, fenced paved yards, container storage, multi-tenant industrial, seeing a lot of large buildings partitioned into smaller flex spaces with warehouses and office space to accommodate a lot of satellite business centers. So where is the market today? Uh, Pre-COVID, industrial had the best growth and stability across really all the product types with 8% increases annually. COVID had a large effect on velocity though. Uh, sales slowed and really it was inventory that was scarce, uh, but we still saw buildings transacting under uh, other you know, unlike many of the other product types, the strength that investors brought to the sector allow it to really recover faster than um, product types where owners are unable to collect rents, especially facing some of this crazy legislation, uh, eviction moratoriums and uh, like rent control, different forms of that. So uh, as you know, positive, uh, there's positive le legislation too in the sector, opportunity zones, for those of you that don't know, the federally funded um, programs that are used to gentrify uh, lower income areas and allow some really fantastic tax benefits. That's a positive. Not to mention both presidential campaigns uh, candidates support strengthening the new American supply chain, which really virtually eliminates uh, our, our reliance on foreign markets and in turn 
uh, is going to create a, a significant need for for um, manufacturing and storage across the U.S. So just to break down some quick numbers, um, to 2020 on average, LA County is looking at about 220 a square foot uh, with an average cap rate of 4.5. OC is about 246 with a cap rate of 5.3. That's actually up from last year, 2019 numbers that were at 225 and a five cap. So while we're only on track of doing about half the volume as, as we did last year, industrial properties are transacting at a higher price per square foot. And that's really a fantastic sign of things to come. Uh, private sales and, and owner user investments continue to dominate the market share at about 70%, which really leads to some very important challenges, uh, which is Proposition 15. For those that are unaware or need a quick recap, California wants to collect about $12 billion annually from commercial property owners by increasing property taxes to market value. It's really the one of the most monumental pieces of legislation in the last 30 years. Uh, Long-term owners can see an increase of property taxes by five to 10 times. And unfortunately, we're getting outbid by supporters donations four to one. And every Democrat representative in California supports the bill. Um, legislation has forced many long-term owners to quickly begin strategizing retirement or redeploying equity into passive income streams outside of California. And Doug touched a lot on the triple nets, and those are fantastic opportunities. Um, you know, anecdotally, I've personally seen a lot of movement and spoke to a lot of people in the last, this is kind of the last straw. They're calling it the, a mass exodus out of California. Um, just moving their, their tenant friendly, you know, real estate into something more landlord friendly is super desirable. Uh, seeing exchange equity out of California into the emerging markets that Doug touched on, uh, Boise, Salt Lake, Colorado, Austin, Provo, really just trying to find that young, educated middle class that has a ton of growth. Um, and that sort of leads to what, what do you do um, if you are an owner? What actions should you be taking? So in addition to opening a dialogue with the tenants, taking a more proactive approach to being a landlord, knowing what your effective tax rate is going to be moving forward uh, for our owner operators who are still actively involved in the business and want to protect their hard-earned equity. We're seeing the sale lease back as a very popular option, uh, maximizing the value of the real estate first. And then over time, you maximize the value of the business. So I'd certainly recommend, um, you know, connecting with an advisor to put that sort of analysis together for you as we are quickly approaching uh, our, the November um election and as you know as soon as 2021 the landscape could look a, a lot different than it does today so i would definitely suggest um getting the ball rolling there if there's any questions i'd be happy to take them otherwise it don it's back to you great job thank you for that sean um it seems like we're not getting too many questions on the right i want to let you guys all know not to be too timid the dumbest question is the one not asked so um, I am getting a lot of comments though on the tie. So those are private texts, not in the chat, but I, I would say thank you to all of those who've been saying nice things. Anyway, <laughs> let's, uh, oh, we do have a question here. Ooh, maybe, uh, this would be a good one for our next, uh, host that's joining us here. So, uh, let's give it up for Mike Alper, the, uh, Orange County multifamily specialist on our team. And Mike, there is a question. If you want to take a bat, uh, take a nap bat here. Um, Chris asks, many people want to sell and leave California. Who is going to buy these California properties? Sure, absolutely. Don, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can't see you, though. All right. There All we right, go. There we go. Great. So to answer that question, starting off, I think uh, the people who are still looking to buy properties in California, a lot of the times it's the usual suspects, the people who already own um, in those cities and in those pockets and are really comfortable owning in those areas. They understand the tenants. They understand the business. Um, there's still people who want to own in California and care about the appreciation that they uh, believe that they can get for years to come. So. Hope that answers that first question. And then I'll kind of start here with a little bit of a Orange County overview. I'm looking at multifamily properties, one to $20 million. And I wanted to start by looking at 
uh, last year versus this year. So I kind of looked at January through August of 2019 versus January through August of 2020. So in 2019, those first eight months, there were 95 transactions. Average building size was about 16 units. Average price per unit in Orange County, 274,000. Uh, average cap rate, about 4.3. Number of units that actually sold was 1,555. And then months from listing to actually closing was four and a half months. And so comparing that with this year, 2020, January through August, there's only been about 50 transactions. So the number of transactions is definitely down from last year. Also, building size this year average units 13 so we've seen the smaller buildings clearing the market uh, quicker than the larger buildings um, average price per unit this is an interesting one um, actually up a little bit from last year in orange county we're at 288,000 um, for price per unit in orange county this year i would probably attribute that to the first quarter of the year being really really strong and also a lot of investors are focusing on the better uh, locations. Um, average cap rate hasn't really changed much, about 4.3 for Orange County. Um, definitely a lot less units have sold, 642 compared to that uh, 1,500 from last year. And then months to sale, about 5.2. So on average, listings are taking a little bit longer to sell um, a lot of the deals had pre-COVID pricing and, uh, you know, while a lot of people like to see upside on deals, they're really focusing, I think, now on the in-place income. Uh, so I'll show you a couple more slides about what we're seeing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is a slide about how people voted in the 2016 presidential election. Uh, you can see areas like Santa Ana, Anaheim, Garden Grove are very blue, and then other areas like Huntington Beach, City of Orange, Yorba Linda, Fullerton are really red. So there's been a number of investors that we've been uh, dealing with and also just seeing out there in the market who have been moving equity from the bluer locations to the redder locations where they believe city governments will be a lot more landlord friendly and there will be a lot less chances of strict forms of rent control such as the 3% uh, rent control initiative that's going on in Santa Ana right now. Next slide, please. Uh, a couple of things we've been focusing on, we've been tracking cap rates, city versus city in Orange County over the past 30 or so years. Uh, this graph shows Santa Ana as the blue line. Those are Santa Ana cap rates. The orange line is Huntington Beach cap rates. And there's definitely times you can see in the market where there's a big difference between the return you would get for owning in a rough like Santa Ana versus a really nice location like Huntington Beach. And over the past couple of years, we've really seen those lines converge. So we think that a lot of people are not pricing risk into the market as much as they were. And uh, we've noticed a lot of people basically moving equity from a rough location to a better location if they can get the same return or similar. Uh, next slide, please. This just shows the 10-year treasury versus Orange County apartment cap rates. Um, the orange line is Orange County apartment cap rates, which are kind of leveling off right now. The blue line is the 10-year treasury, which has gone almost straight down. And uh, what's followed that are interest rates. So the delta between the 10-year treasury and cap rates is about as wide as we've seen since 2012. We think it's really important because there's going to be an opportunity for positive leverage deals now, uh, as you can get a very low interest rate and a little bit higher of a cap rate. So that makes deals look a lot better, which is, which is a good thing. Um, next slide, please. Kind of to finish up, I'll just talk about two uh, families that we recently helped down here in Orange County. Uh, the first one is uh, owners in Santa Ana. They had the six units on top, the yellow building, property family for almost 30 years. Uh, it was a really old property, 36 construction. 
Rents were extremely low, about 25% below market. They had a lot of deferred maintenance. The roof was shot, electrical on fuses. Um, the concrete in the back was so cracked, it was hard for them to get insurance. Uh, but more importantly, they had no leverage or depreciation left. Um, they felt comfortable. They felt like they couldn't do better. And what we showed them was a 10-year comparative analysis uh, their property over the next 10 years, how it's going to perform if they keep things exactly the same versus if they exchange into a couple of properties that are out there currently available. And what they, what they realized is that they could do a lot better. So we ended up closing the top deal for a million five twenty five, rolling their equity into the bottom one, which is nine units in southwest Anaheim, right across from Western High School. Uh, really well-maintained 76 construction buildings, so about 40 years newer than what they sold. Um, what was so awesome about it is that you would think, hey, if they have a property where, they're, where they have no loan at all, and now they're going into a, a property where they're going to have a $950,000 loan, that they're definitely going to make less cash flow, right? But in this case, the rents were so much closer to market and they did a cost segregation study. So they actually cash flow the bigger building with the loan about 10 grand a year more than the, the worst building in Santa Ana. And in general, they just ended up with a building that was easier to manage, closer to home, way better tenants. And uh, over time, they're going to make about a million dollars more when you count cash flow, principal reduction and appreciation. So that was an awesome family that we helped. Uh, next slide. And this will kind of speak to the out-of-state uh, transactions. Uh, this was one that I completed uh, earlier this year. Um, the family had six units in a really rough part of Santa Ana, a street called Evergreen Street. Um, there was a ton of deferred maintenance, as you can probably tell from the picture. Rents were super low, 30% below market. Um, return on equity, when we looked at their after tax net cash flow divided by the amount of equity they had tied up in the property they were sub two percent and they knew that you know rent control was coming um we had listed it at the end of 2019 they knew rent control ab 1482 was coming they knew that there were these three percent rent control initiatives for santa Ana specifically so we ended up selling that one for a million four fifty and rolling all that straight into an out-of-state jiffy lube uh, that they were really happy with um, that was 90s construction had a long-term 15-year triple net lease on it um, it's the largest operator of jiffy lubes in the country so 546 locations across 26 states zero management or maintenance responsibilities and they got it at a six cap so huge win for them and we've uh, been helping a lot of people go out of state to places where they think it'll be uh, more landlord friendly so yeah, that kind of wraps it up uh, for Orange County, unless there's any questions. Thanks, Mike, great job. And as you can all see, uh, we at Centennial, um, all these uh, wonderful specialists that have been talking to you so far today are getting deals done. And so while you're seeing some of the overall uh, numbers in the market and seeing the trends, um, the reality is, is that uh, we are still doing deals. There are still buyers to try to take a crack at that answer for Chris too. I would say that while you're right, there are many people um, wanting to sell and leave California. There's tons of people that are also wanting to come to California. And I think that we see a lot more uh, with higher incomes coming than lower incomes, which kind of leads us to uh, probably think about buying properties well located with uh, good types of tenant bases. Um, I guess now is my little section. I get to talk to you guys a little bit about Valley, uh, San Fernando Valley market um, and apartment trends. And so I've got a couple of slides here uh, that really just kind of show, ooh, they can't even see them, but they show kind of a lot of what we're already seeing from all the other speakers, which is really that uh, from, I took the last year of sales from CoStar and took a report um, from August to February, six months, and then February to now. Um, and really, we are seeing a slowdown in transactions or a little bit uh, less in volume. I think there was a total of 56 transactions between August of last year and February this year. And so far this year, six months, we've seen only 37. It's not a huge difference. And a lot of times I would say the fourth quarter is the uh, 
most, uh, you know, most transactions we see uh, more than all the other quarters typically. So that could have something to do with it. But when you look at the price per foot, which I highlighted, if you could see, um, hasn't been too much of an adjustment. It's, it's changed from 295 a foot the previous six months to the more current six months at 299. Uh, that could have probably, that's not really a big uh, change and it could be a reflection of the price per unit change, which might have to do with the unit mix. Um, price per unit really hasn't uh, gone down much. We've seen a slight decrease from 232,000 to 226,000 per unit. I think what uh, I did notice a slight change in was the GRM. Um, we've probably seen an adjustment of around 60 basis points on the GRM closing over the last six months from the previous six months and a about 14 bips for the um, cap rate. So I think with a slowdown um, of, or velocity has slowed down, the pricing has stayed so strong as we've heard already today. Um, I think the focus really uh, has been moving equity um, as we see a lot of 1031 exchange clients uh, just moving equity in it and improving their location or um, age of the asset, um, such as some of the examples that we just heard from uh, Mike. Uh, had a very similar um, client who decided to um, sell their six units in a very gritty location of the San Fernando Valley. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with it over on Woodman and call it Van Owen, uh, we were able to uh, generate a lot of activity. We got a total of 22 offers on their down leg because we priced it well. Um, and the real benefit for them was that the uh, escrow, uh, we got into escrow right as the uh, first stay at home order was in effect. And so we managed to be able to use all that competition to keep that buyer uh, on, on uh, course with his transaction, which was also a 1031 exchange. And as a result, we were able to uh, close the deal. Um, and within just a few weeks, actually within the same 30 day time frame, uh, we closed on their up leg, which was a 12 unit, all bungalow styles, and we were able to increase their total units by double, going from six to 12. And we helped them actually improve the location significantly uh, and the lot size went up by actually four times. And so um, that's what I am kind of would say that we're seeing in general, a lot of uh, activity happening from people that are looking to uh, move equity to better locations or better assets. I think the time is still really, really good for that especially as people are concerned about um, rents and you know tenants paying. I think in general, um, as COVID started, we were hearing a lot of people say, well, let's see what's gonna happen in uh, April and well, let's see what's gonna happen in May. And it just kept moving on to June and July. And now we're gonna see what's gonna happen in September. I think the reality is, is um, the people that, uh, that can pay are gonna pay. And there's uh, obviously uh, always a small amount of the uh, quote unquote, uh, you know, people taking advantage, or I don't know if we can say douchebags on this webinar, but I'll say it. Um, but for the people that are struggling, there's going to be obviously um, some sort of relief, as we've seen there has been so far. So it's hard to guess where it's going to go, but I would say this is even um, more of a reason to consider if you have a lot of equity sitting in a location that could definitely be improved. Uh, cap rates and 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 gross rent multipliers are still very compressed. Uh, in the markets that we're seeing that are, would say, more gritty, and you can move your equity into some places that are more pretty. Um, most of the uh, buyers that we're seeing right now are obviously looking for um, the numbers to, to make sense on today's income. I think that we are seeing a little less of an eagerness to invest in properties based on the upside, uh, and that's probably with the um, looming uh, Proposition 21 that's going to be coming up in November. For those of you that aren't aware or familiar with or need more information on Prop 21, make sure that you tune in next week to our webinar um, as we're going to be diving into that in depth uh, when our fearless leader, Justin White, is back with us. Um, so that's pretty much concluding for my update on the Valley assets. Uh, Without further ado, I do want to introduce, or introduce our final guest and speaker, um, Joel Samai. Hopefully, um, the technological aspect of this is working. But as we try to get him logged in here, Joel uh, is the president of Versa Capital Inc. Uh, Versa Capital is a real estate financing firm that works with investors and developers in arranging debt uh, and equity for their projects. 
Joel actually um, works on all asset types, including multifamily, office, retail, hotels, industrial, and self-storage. Um, prior to starting Versa Capital, Joel worked at Lehman Brothers in their global real estate group and was also the chief investments officer at a real estate development company. Um, this was all after receiving his his bachelor's and his MBA from USC. Go Trojans for those of you on the call. Um, and just for those of you that don't know, I know Joel personally and professionally, I've actually worked with him on various financing transactions with my clients. He's super knowledgeable, uh, very attentive to all of the client's needs, and he's just all in all a great resource to call upon uh, for any financing needs. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joel. Can you hear me? Can you hear you? Thank you. Thanks, Edan. I appreciate your introduction. Um, for everyone, my name is Joel. Um, I want to just take a few minutes, because I know we're short on time, to give you kind of an overview on what's going on in the real estate financing uh, market. Um, many of you guys already know that rates are pretty low, but I'll maybe hit uh, real quickly on the various lender types that are out there. We've got the banks, we've got CMBS lenders, you've got the agency, which is Freddie Fannie, uh, credit unions and uh, insurance companies. So that kind of encompasses the various uh, lenders that are out there for all product types, whether it's multifamily, office, retail, industrial, self-storage. Um, within each of those segments of, of the lending uh, platforms, I'll kind of dive in real quickly. You know, banks right now are pretty uh, active again in the marketplace, right? Uh, post COVID, a lot of them either kind of left the market or they started increasing their rates so high that effectively they were out of the market in terms of financing. But in the past month or two months, uh, they're starting to kind of get their footings back and really trying to get an understanding of what's going on in the marketplace and they're back in. And I would say in the past week, uh, we're seeing rates really getting uh, pretty compressed for them. And it's, it's actually surprising to see, uh, but it's good for real estate owners, uh, developers. Right now from a bank, uh, from a banking perspective, if you're looking at multifamily, you're probably getting somewhere in the rates on a five year at about three and a quarter to 3.35 up to a 10 year and we're seeing it around 3.6, 3.75. Um, obviously you've got to be aware that the leverage point is you're somewhere in on the 60% and mostly are recourse, uh, most banks are recourse lenders. Um, there are some that will do not recourse for some, you know, extra uh, pricing and rate. Um, as far as uh, commercial lending, whether it's office, retail, uh, right now, retail is pretty much, given everything that's going on, it's, it's, it's on the chopping block for most lenders. They don't want to really get too involved with it. Um, office buildings are still getting financed, although um, at a lower leverage. Um, so, so the banks are starting to get you know, pretty active. The agency lenders, um, they're great. They're, their rates are actually even more aggressive than banks. Uh, but what they do require is, you know, they're, they're much more... Uh, given everything's going on, they've changed their interest reserve requirements. They have a minimum of 12 months, whereas some banks now are kind of taking that and putting it aside where they were requiring reserves, but now they're not. So that's a, a good comparison. An agency, it's usually if you're doing a non-recourse loan, 10 year fix, you know, you're going to be holding it for a long time. It's a great place to be on the multi side. Um, as far as CMBS, CMBS, it's a, again, it's non-recourse lending. Uh, you get the max leverage, but again, it's you know, product type specific. They'll go into secondary markets, uh, but given what's been going on in the marketplace, uh, they're not as aggressive, but they're, they're still out there lending. So depending on what you're trying to accomplish, CMBS might be a good place for uh, your product and what you're trying to accomplish. Credit unions, uh, they were pretty much out of commercial lending for the most part. They were active on the triple net side. If you have triple net, where uh, some of the uh, people on the call were indicating they just did some jiffy loops and whatnot. Uh, for the right bar and the right credit tenant, uh, credit, uh, credit unions are actually pretty active on triple net side. And as far as multifamily, they're back in. Um, they're a great source. Uh, again, depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, insurance companies, um, my guess is most uh, 
most of the people who are going to the insurance companies to get financing. Super, it's got to be a really good quality product. Um, larger loans, you're probably looking at, you know, 10 million and up, and it's going to be more uh, conservative in terms of leverage. Um, lastly, um, you know, given our time, I want to just give you guys some perspective on what's been going on. It's just some data that I got I thought would be interesting. Right now, uh, I just read that 1,000 malls are going to be closing over the next probably three years. That's 25% of the American malls. Um, the other interesting thing that Moody's put out some data this morning that apartment development in the U.S. will be decreasing by about 15%. Uh, office development by 10% and retail by about 15%. The reason I want to mention this real quick is because I think given all the conversation we just had during this hour, um, if development is going to go down, then the existing stock that we have, it's going to be interesting to see how valuation will change. I think some places it might stay the same or go up. Other places it might go down, again, depending on location specific. But, um, and then one last thing, as far as hotels, if anybody is doing any hotel transaction, financing is pretty much uh, very difficult right now, considering that most hotels have lost, you know, 80 to 90% of their revenues. Uh, but with that, given our short time, I just want to, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions, uh, but I'll give it back to you now. Thank you, Joel, appreciate that. Um, just want to take this chance if we don't have any other questions coming in um, to thank everyone who uh, was attending. Um, special thanks to all the guests that uh, helped present some really fabulous content and information. Um, a very special thank you to our staff for making this happen and making it run so smoothly. So thank you, Camille. I think Maria's somewhere behind the scenes helping too. So thank you, ladies. Um, quick reminder for everyone next week, um, Justin will be back and we'll be discussing more legislation, um, specifically diving into Prop 21. Um, so you definitely want to be in there, uh, be on this call as, as it's going to be, uh, well, it's definitely something that's been on most people's uh, minds lately. It's definitely something for, for investors to be concerned or at least conscious of. Um, finally, I just want to close and remind everybody that uh, we at Centennial um, we're a collaborative firm, so we really do pride ourselves in putting our clients' needs above our individual and our company desires. So if you are uh, working with any of us specifically, but you're interested maybe in making some other moves or uh, learning about some other markets or kind of, you know, tapping in there um, or other asset types, just let us know. Um, we do share all of you for your own good. And so feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, we all do collaborate. We share our database and our conversations and we regularly discuss what's going on so that we can help provide a much better uh, experience for investors and uh, owners alike. Um, so that's it for our time. Again, thank you all for joining and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week.